Hello, friends, and how are we doing today? Hope you're doing well. Good to see you, diarrhea. Welcome, I'm Paige, I'm autistic. That's all you need to know for prior context. Let's just like keep going. I wasn't diagnosed autistic until I was 15. And so here are 15 traits. Nope, 10. I only have 10. Here are 10. So here are 10 traits of autism in early childhood so that you can detect it if this is your child. Number one, colic. What the heck is colic? Apparently, colic is when a baby cries for more than three hours a day straight for seemingly no reason. About 20% of babies have colic, and I was one of those babies. And I can tell you a little bit about my babyhood and what was seemingly colic. It was sensory issues, Barbara. I wasn't crying for no reason. I was crying because I was uncomfortable. Do you know how difficult it is to be a baby? Do you recall being a baby? Imagine being an autistic baby. Imagine having diaper rash as an autistic baby. Even just that is enough to make you cry for three hours straight. But everything else that a baby has to go through, think about the lack of autonomy, the lack of understanding, the lack of attention sometimes, and I mean, especially for some people, digestive issues out the wazoo, it can be very difficult being a baby. And it's especially difficult if you're experiencing sensory issues as an autistic person. I really wish that my parents spent more time with me and spent more time connecting with me and trying to understand me when I was a baby. That would have made me cry less would have made me feel better and more comfortable. Number two, repeating what they've heard from TV shows and songs. This is actually called echolalia. And it's really common in autistic people because autistic people are likely to be gestalt learning processors. Now a gestalt learning processor learns language by learning chunks of language and understanding language as a whole rather than the sum of its parts. So a big way that I communicated when I was little was repeating lines and phrases that I knew from different TV shows, different movies, different songs, different friends that I'd talked to, or phrases that people often repeated themselves in their own sentences, just patterns that I noticed and picked up on. Autistic kids often have really good memories too, so they may use phrases from TV shows that you definitely won't even know about because it, they probably saw it years ago. But this is also why using media and different forms of media can be beneficial for autistic kids. It can actually be a way for them to learn and practice language and communicating. Number three, craving vestibular stimulation. What the heck is vestibular? Yeah, it's like when you need to move your head. Tubes in your ears and they detect your movement and your balance and your, what am I saying, your direction in space, your reference to being upside down. Autistic kids likely want to feel the water swashing in their ears. It's a very funky sensation. And I was a big spinner when I was a kid. I was spinning, I was swinging, loved the swing, loved those bouncy ball things you jumped on, loved the thing that you sit on and spin yourself, loved rocking back and forth, loved swaying my head, loved going side to side, loved the trampoline. A lot of autistic kids are like this. And a lot of autistic kids could do stuff like this forever, even if it disregards their safety. There was one summer where I think in one day I did over a thousand butts, like butt bounces on the trampoline just because I wanted to. And then my spine hurt so badly I couldn't walk for the rest of the summer, which was like a month. I just mucked up all the muscles, just mucked them up. As a teacher, it's the kids that when they're given the opportunity to move freely, they want to spin around. They love doing butt spins. They love just spinning in circles. Gotta remind them to spin the other way as well, or they will get like lopsided. <laughs> it's the kids who won't get off the freaking exercise balls when I bring them out. I love it. That's important. Moving is important. And autistic kids have a way of moving that makes sense to them. And we should nourish that. Number four, does something not not as intended, but as a way to organize it. An autistic child will see all of the toys, but then often find a way to play with them that involves sorting them by color by shape, by size, by genre, by system, by this is what this thing does, this is what this thing does. A lot of the time setting up the play is more fun and more interesting than actually playing. As a teacher, it's the kids that take the manipulatives that I've laid out and start sorting them, start organizing them by color, by shape, or start putting them in their own little patterns that I didn't ask them to do. And it confirmed this when they get all excited, Miss Paige, Miss Paige, you gotta see this. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I go, have you counted them? And when they're like, <gasps> and they go counting them, I'm like, oh, you don't know me, but I know you. I don't really know how to explain that one yet. It just feels good. Just makes sense, just feels good. Kind of pressure, I don't know, to have all this imagination sometimes and play with stuff in your own way. I'm like, how about I just do stuff that makes sense? I don't know, this makes sense to me. It makes my brain go, so that's how it works. Number five, they play alone. Now this can be by choice or not by choice, often a combination of both because autistic kids are usually different from other kids. Can we believe that? Meaning they usually have different interests than the other kids. So even with other kids, they can tend to be alone just because the game that they want to play 
doesn't involve other people. It doesn't need other people. Or maybe the game that does involve other people is not interesting to the autistic kid. And like I said earlier, they usually play differently, like by setting up the scene and enjoying that more than playing the scene. Also, autistic kids may have PDA, and so other kids, and perhaps even their parents, may find them bossy and difficult to play with. You may find like the autistic kid is always changing the rules, or always frustrated, or gets angry and is micromanaging every little thing you do. That's very, that's, that's very autistic. And also, and if this is happening, I mean, watch my PDA videos if you want to, but also remember that a child, you know, they're new to this universe and they have to figure out emotional regulation and they are very, very stressed. And just remember that this all comes from stress and anxiety. It doesn't come from a want or need to control. It comes from a confusion on how to live on this earth. And as a parent, if you feel safe enough to let them do so, which I mean, if they're a child and it's a game, let them control you. Let them boss you around a little bit. It'll build both of your bonds. Number six, stomach issues. There are so many reasons why autistic people have stomach issues and so many reasons why autistic children have stomach issues. First of all, autistic people likely have trouble with interoception, which is reading slash understanding slash receiving the body's cues for what it needs. For example, going to the bathroom. A lot of autistic people don't know when it's time to go to the bathroom. This super applies to children who don't know much of anything and are here to learn all of those things. So first of all, this needs to be explicitly taught to every child. It needs to be taught what it feels like when you use the bathroom, how many times a day you should be going to the bathroom, what happens if you do not go to the bathroom on time or regularly, not in an anxiety way, but as in this is a healthy thing to do. And if this isn't happening, then I want you to let me know. Because I'll tell you as an autistic, kid, I did not go to the bathroom when I needed to. I also had PDA, so I could like know when I needed to go to the bathroom sometimes, but I was like, what the heck is that? What the heck is that signal trying to make me do? I, I, no, I was busy. I was doing things. Um, don't boss me around. And then that made a whole bunch of digestive issues because you're not supposed to do that with anything that wants to come out. You're, it's supposed to come out of you. What else makes stomach problems though? Autistic people likely have food aversions. It can be difficult to eat. It can be difficult to find any foods that an autistic kid will eat, but it can be especially difficult to make those foods healthy and diverse and make them really nourishing. When I was a kid, I ate a bologna sandwich with mustard on white, white Wonder Bread every single day from grade, from kindergarten to grade eight. Bologna sandwiches and cupboard foods and dinners from the freezer and dino nuggets. They're lovely. They're good. They're safe. They don't do too well on the tum-tum. They don't and not for long, you know? My stomach has never felt better than when I was vegan for a bit, but then I couldn't, couldn't do that, long story, that's another video. But when I'm trying to eat as many fruits and vegetables as possible. Oh, and may I also say, stress does a number on your stomach. And autistic people, stressed motherfuckers we are. Especially autistic people that cannot express themselves and cannot communicate that to their caregiver, that this thing needs to change and the caregiver just doesn't know and cannot change it. Those autistic people who just have to live in the discomfort. Ooh, my stomach hurts for you. Number seven, inappropriate laughter slash inappropriate emotions or emotional responses. And when I say inappropriate, I mean like, inappropriate. you know, I personally am like, there is no appropriate way to respond to something, especially something like, like grievy. There's no appropriate way. I especially feel that as an autistic person, who I am, I'm like, I'm now going to react and respond however my body needs to. And I'm not ashamed of that and what it means to other people. Emotions are just energy in our body. And being autistic, we have a disconnection with what our body wants us to know and how it comes out in a physical form. It's very likely that an emotion is going to get mixed up in my body signals. And it's going to come out as a reaction that doesn't seem typical. I'm not I used to laugh when something was like disgusting and terrifying, like a bloody or gory scene from a movie, something that made my body physically uncomfortable. I would cry and laugh and it was so weird and embarrassing, but I couldn't control it. I would laugh uncontrollably, but I felt so uncomfortable. Also, I am the most emotional person that I know. I'm crying 20 times a day and I'm not afraid of it or ashamed of it. I love my big emotions, but holy Lord, I cannot cry at few funerals and it scared me. My first funeral I was at, I'm like, why am I not crying? Well, maybe it's because I don't know this person. It's like my mom's aunt and I never met her, but I'm like, I'm not, I'm not crying. This is strange. 
And I've gone to more funerals since then. And I've gone to funerals for friends of mine and haven't been crying. And I'm like, Paige, what is, uh, what is wrong with you? What's the dealio? I used to be embarrassed and try to make myself cry because I didn't want to seem like a bad person. But now that I think about it, there's so much more to a funeral than grieving. There's actually not really a lot of grieving allowed to be done at a funeral, especially when you're autistic. It's a lot of social gathering and people that want to talk to you and hug you and everyone is crying and upset and there are a lot of noises, a lot going on, a lot of people you don't know. I care about what you have to say but I also have no idea who you are and my connection to everyone is different and everyone has different relationships and weird and I have to navigate so much. And there's a dead body in the room. We may react differently to different situations than you because we don't view situations the same as you. <laughs> Example A. <laughs> Number eight, being unusually interested in a very specific niche subject or genre. Not just like a stuffed animal or something that they got for Christmas and they love, something weird. Maybe it's like a topic that they just can't stop researching about every time they see a picture of it or an article of it or a toy of it or a different thing come out about it. They're like, I, ah, I need to have it. If they've got a wall dedicated to this one thing, mm -hmm. if they're collecting it a bunch, if they got to sleep with it, if they got to sleep with all of their things that they've collected, mm. and people are like, well, it's rocks. Like, it's fine. I collected rocks from the age of three. I still collect rocks to this day at 23. I'm autistic, Barbara. Collecting anything? Little autistic, check that out. Why you want so much? Autism, probably. Maybe not. I'm not a psychiatrist. They may have an obsession talking about it, bringing it everywhere with them, bringing it to the bathroom with them. They may want to talk about it to other people and not understand that they are not interested in the same topic at all and will continue to talk about it when people are obviously not into it. By obviously, I mean like obvious to you as the parent, but definitely not as an autistic child. Having a big emotional and almost human attachment to something that's not human. We feel a lot and we feel very deeply. I used to have these big feelings for pieces of garbage. Wrappers that I had, I'd feel bad because I knew what happened in a landfill and I knew what would happen to my garbage. It would just get crushed and it would be dirty and it would be stinky and I'd been to the landfill and there's seagulls everywhere eating things and I would just cry thinking about putting my garbage through that and so I'd keep it because I didn't want to hurt its feelings. Which again, you know, that's an anxiety-based thing. Oh man, yeah, it's a lot of anxiety, ain't it? Yeah. That's not even one of the numbers, but like if your kid has extreme anxiety and are having panic attacks that are a lot, multiple times a day, multiple times a week, multiple times a month, and they're like, whoa, like, are you going to die right now? Yeah, maybe autism. That's not like just anxiety, you know? That's why do you feel that much? Number nine, this one's important. This one is specifically for me, but it's also the kids that I've seen as a teacher. If your kid doesn't like messy play or doesn't enjoy being messy, that could be an indicator of autism. A lot of autistic people have sensory issues, especially with touch. When I was a kid, there was no way you were gonna catch me with my skin in the mud at all, which ixnade a lot. It ixnade swimming in the lake. I'm not swimming in that lake. I'm not getting all that mud in my toes. I'm not splashing in puddles. You're not gonna find me four wheeling through the mud. I didn't like playing in sand. I didn't like playing amongst the trees. I would get like scraped and bumped and everything was rough everywhere. Finger painting, nope, I don't like paint in my hands. I would miss out on playing with a lot of the other kids because I didn't like that feeling. And I was really like, they were like, oh, ha, about it because I look like this and my eye pink and purple and they're like she's just a little princess girl who doesn't want to get dirty and i'm like i don't care about getting dirty i care about feeling bleh on me you know i don't want to feel it but this is just sensory issues in general so if this happens look out for if they have sensory issues with other messes as well like having a dirty diaper i know that makes like anyone would be uncomfortable but autistic kids would be especially uncomfortable with that i was sensitive to having a lot of food all over my face not a fan of that didn't like showering, still do not. Are there any autistics out there that just love a good mess? Like I'll say that there is, there are messes that I can tolerate and would like to tolerate and would like to put my hands in. But even like a lot of things that I would like to touch, they are dry. They do not leave my hands with any residue when I take my hands off. In fact, if it's going to do so, I will probably refrain from touching it. I don't want residue. And number 10, the almighty number 10, it is sleep problems. 
actually just did a video on sleep problems that you can go look at. Again, this leads to anxiety. <laughs> did you know that autistic people had anxiety and were anxious? I didn't know that. But it can be a lot of reasons, a lot of things. Sleep is cyclical. It's something that has to happen or else your body isn't going to work. As a PDA autistic kid, that was not happening and not working for me. I really had a problem with feeling like I had to sleep and feeling like sleep had an authority over me. Also, I found Guys, let me know if it's you, if you're autistic, but I get like my most wound up creative, I gotta do stuff like right before I go to bed. And I don't know if it's just cause I have PDA and I'm just like procrastinating and I'm like, I can't do this right now. I'm procrastinating sleeping and going to bed. But I also know when I was little, I needed like 20 minutes of ripping time before I could go to bed. It's hard to go from awake and life is happening and blah, 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 blah to okay, you now have to shut down be isolated, change your clothes, close your eyes, stop your talking, stop playing with your toys, and now just sit alone with your thoughts, baby girl, and then let your thoughts soothe you to bed. Oh, yeah, that wasn't going to fly. There are different things that needed to happen first. I mean, you can go check out my video for all of the sleep problems that I had, but if you were getting stress and avoidance and anger and meltdowns around bedtime, before bedtime, excuses about bedtime, you just can't get them to brush your teeth, put their pajamas on, or get ready for bed. I'm just saying. Like, if I'm, I'm not a medical professional. I'm just a gal who has been autistic for 23 and a half years. So I just, I only know some things, and I'm just speaking, you know, from experience. If you have all of these things and you're not autistic, well, then I don't know what to tell you. That's weird. I'm, I don't know about that. I think you might be. If you, if, if you check out all of these things, yeah, I think you might be autistic, actually, in my opinion. But that's just my opinion. Who cares about me? I don't know. I'm Paige Layout. This has been stuff about about me. If you like me or care about me at all, you could subscribe because I know that like 75% of you are just watching, just hanging out, which is fine. You know, I love that. I love that you think that this is a free space and it is, and it is. I'm just saying that if you're around and you've watched a few videos, you don't even have to subscribe. Okay. Don't even sub. Don't even sub. I just, you know, you could like it. A like, Oh, comment down your autistic childhood traits that I missed. I would love to see what are the most popular. And peace out, Girl Scout. I love you so much. And I'll see you um, eventually. I don't know. Okay, goodbye. Shout out to the lady who gave me this at PV Mart for free because it didn't have a price tag on it. And I told her, oh, I think it was $5.99. And she's like, I don't care. I ain't walking. And just threw it in my bag. You a real one. <laughs> This is the end of the video song. This video is to tell you the video's done. If you're hearing this, it's because the video's done. Go watch another one. Boop, boop. Have a good day. Love you so much. Bye.